Well, I want to say thank you um, uh, to your church and to Pastor Ricky and Linda, uh, for my wife Vicky and I. By the way, I should introduce you to the better half. Vicky, uh, do you want to stand up? Of course you don't, but anyway, would you? Oh! <laughs> no, no! That's my second wife. No. Uh, did you stand up? You did. I didn't see it. I mean, there, do it again. There she is, Vicky. So um, I want to say thank you to Ricky and Linda because they uh, they have ministered uh, to Vicky and me personally, uh, very dear and close friends. And they just, they just love us and bless us. And, and I am here, uh, you know, from San Diego, learning stand-up paddle. <laughs> right? With Ricky Ryan. And I am this close to catching a wave. <laughs> so you pray for me, <laughs> and I'll pray for you. Um, I, I have uh, recently uh, written a book, and... Um, it is coming out. It's not out yet. I really wish that it was available today because um, I did want to come and, and share about that, which I will a little bit today. It's coming out next month, February the 18th, uh, through Waterbrook. It's called The Holy Land Key. But the good news about this is it gives me an excuse to come back. So anyway, uh, I want to share with you a little bit about prophecy. If you have a Bible, you can open it to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verse 25. And these, these are some things that probably some of you have, have heard a little bit about, maybe through the grapevine. Uh, there are some signs in the heavens that are coming um, in, in just a couple of months. Um, there are some red moons, and I'm not going to go into great detail this time, but I'm going to mention them because it's so close. And I believe that God is actually giving us signs in the sky and in the heavens of the nearness of his return. Is anybody excited about Jesus coming back? <laughs> so Luke chapter 21, verse 25. So this is Jesus' words himself to his disciples. Jesus said about the coming of the Son of Man, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And I think that uh, is both not only in, in nature, but spiritually in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the angels and the fallen angels and the spiritual warfare taking place there. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Amen? Yeah. It's time, I, I have an amazing uh, message for you. It's time to wake up and to look up. Jesus is coming soon. That's the whole thing in a nutshell. All right? So, amen. Let's close in prayer. No. Okay, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the hope of your coming and of your kingdom. And I pray that this word, as it goes out, uh, Lord, will shake us, that it will awaken us, uh, that some maybe who have been spiritually seeking, and maybe there are some here this morning that are not even really uh, yet believers or uh, committed Christians, but they're open, they're open-minded, they're searching. And for whatever reason that, that they are here today or that will listen to this message, I thank you that they have the, the respect uh, to, to sit and to listen, which is really the first step in following Jesus. And Lord, there may be some that say, you know, I've been listening. I, I've been following a, a bit, and, and I'm ready to kind of take the plunge. I'm ready to begin this journey of a spiritual life with God through your son, Jesus. So Lord, we pray that you would be glorified, that your Holy Spirit would speak to the church, and that we would hear what the Spirit says to her in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name. And everyone said... Amen. Okay, uh, if you want to write down, I've, I've just got a few scriptures I'll be sharing with you. You can read them later. But Jeremiah chapter 31, <clears throat> um, I would love for you to read sometime in your devotional that entire chapter of Jeremiah 31. talks about the new covenant 
uh, that God has given to us through Jesus Christ. But there's a verse in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 6. And it says, For there shall be a day when the watchman will cry on Mount Ephraim, Arise, and let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. Now, Vicky and I, we've been going to uh, Israel, and Ricky and Linda, we've, you know, they've gone to Israel, and it's so fun uh, to go to Israel and see the Bible really coming alive, and visit uh, the ancient stones and the places where, wow, this is real, this really happened. Here's the Sea of Galilee, this is where Jesus did the miracles and walked on the water. So there is a city in uh, what the world calls the West Bank, very controversial area where there are some Jewish cities, uh, the world calls settlements, and there's one place called Ariel. The Lord miraculously brought us into a relationship with this Jewish mayor named Ron Nachman. He's always called the Honorable Ron Nachman. Uh, he was kind of like the John Wayne of Israel. Um, he, a tough-minded, uh, not a really religious guy, but yet believed in God and the God of the prophets. So Vicky and I are there. We're in the mountains of Judea and Samaria, and we're planting vines. And so, you know, it's kind of a thing they did for uh, Christian pilgrims to come. And then this Jewish mayor opens the Bible to Jeremiah 31 and reads to us this beginning passage, the first 15 verses. He says it talks about the watchmen coming and that they will cry out, arise, let us go to Zion, the Lord our God. He goes, do you know what we Jews call the watchmen? And we're like, I don't know, what? And he goes, well, the, the word watchman in Hebrew is Nazrim. And Nazrim is literally, um, it, it means the branch. And the branch, Nazrim, that's why Jesus was called a Nazarene. He was raised in Nazareth, that means the branch. And there's a prophecy about this righteous branch that will come. Well, the association in Hebrew with uh, Nazarene, Jesus the Nazarene, they said, therefore, we call the watchmen of Jeremiah 31 Christians. The watchmen are Christians. So he said, the fact that you and other Christians are coming to the mountains of Judea and Samaria and planting vines, we see as a sign of the coming of the Messiah. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. And um, so Isaiah, if you write down this scripture, you can read it uh, later, but Isaiah chapter 62, verses six and seven. God says this, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent and give him no rest until he establishes until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. You know, uh, I believe it's uh, in the Psalms, I think it's Psalm 122, verse 6. There's only one city uh, that the Bible commands us to pray for the peace of. What would that be? Jerusalem. Yes, Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. <laughs> so I want to encourage you to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, having said that, there's no city more contentious that has brought more wars and conflicts than the city of Jerusalem, right? And in many ways, uh, it's going to take, uh, unfortunately, another great war called the Battle of Armageddon before peace finally comes. But we do pray for that. But the Lord has given watchmen. And um, I, I have been on an amazing journey uh, the last 15 years or so where God has brought uh, Vicky and I into relationships and, and with a very special man with a powerful prophetic gift that actually came and prophesied uh, to Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel. And when he was first time the, the uh, Prime Minister of Israel, and the word of the Lord came uh, through this very prophetic guy who's from Africa, and he said, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Lord God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Holy One of Israel has told you that if you negotiate land for peace, he will personally remove you from office. Well, Netanyahu looked at this guy and he goes, what, so you, you're another a mad prophet coming uh, you know, to prophesy to us? He goes, have you heard what we do to prophets whose things don't come true? <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, to make a long story short, Benjamin Netanyahu came to America. He was brought by the president of that time to Camp David 
and he came back to Israel and reneged on his word. He had said one thing, he came to America, we made a lot of assurances and promises, he came back and he said, I've changed my mind, we're gonna go in this direction, and immediately he was taken out of office. So another time <clears throat> we come, and this very prophetic man uh, sees Benjamin Netanyahu with his wife, and his he points to his wife, and he says, there's the man who told me what would happen uh, if I compromised, there he is. And so again, to shorten the story, but uh, the Lord brought us, <laughs> I got this amazing call. Is any, do you guys know who Bob Coy is? Some of you know who Bob Coy is? Bob Coy is a very, he's very anointed pastor. He's got this mega church in Florida. He's very funny. He's kind of like if, if Dana Carvey got saved and was a preacher, he's really <laughs> a lot like that. But anyway, I got a call from uh, two of my pastors who I had sent to Israel to check out Ron Nachman, the city of Ariel, uh, the West Bank, the controversy, and, and is this real? God, are you calling me? I didn't look for this. It kind of came to me. And my assistant, two of my assistant pastors called and said, Ray, you're not going to believe this. But, uh, and this is after Benjamin Netanyahu had been kicked out of office. And uh, they said, Benjamin Netanyahu wants to come to Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, with Bob Coy, and he wants to address uh, the church and the Jews of Fort Lauderdale. I said, what? And I'm thinking, how does, how does Netanyahu know who Bob Coy is? And uh, so anyway, I called Bob Coy, and I said, Bob, I said, I don't know how to tell you this, but the former prime minister of Israel wants to come to your church, Calvary Chapel, and he, he's got a message he wants to share about Jews and Christians coming together, and Bob Coy, without missing a beat, said, oh, that's great, because next week we've got Billy Graham, then we've got Mother Teresa, I think we can fit him in after. <laughs> He thought I was joking, because we joke a lot, you know? <laughs> it took me 15 minutes before he said, are you serious? So anyway, you can go on Fort Lauderdale's website and you can actually listen to the message Benjamin Netanyahu gave and addressed to Christians and Jews and what, a, a, what an amazing hour. We are at an hour between Christians and Jews that we have not been together, that we need one another in 2,000 years. There are things going on in Israel that are absolutely mind-boggling. There are appearances of Jesus to uh, rabbis and uh, you know, people in the army, uh, let alone Muslims that are having dreams and visions of Jesus. This is the most un, you know, unparalleled, nothing has happened like this in world history. I mean, God is right in the epicenter bringing people to the Lord. Now, I have a word. Um, when I was reading this and, and saying, Lord, why, how am I in this and why am I in this? And the Lord spoke to me, um, and he said, Ray, you are one of my watchmen. So I am coming, you know, I am coming here in absolute shaky humility, but I also come here telling you that I heard the Lord say to me, you're not the watchman or the only watchman, but you are a watchman on the wall. And, and you need to get the message out to my bride, because in heaven we're getting ready for a wedding right now. And the bride needs to wake up and needs to look up and start getting really serious because you're not long for this world. I'm coming back and I want a happy, joyful, clean, pure, excited bride for the wedding that is to come. Can I hear an amen on that? Is that? So I have a word for you because we don't know the day and the hour the Lord is going to come. Uh, by the way, that's part of a Jewish wedding. I don't know if you knew that or not. But in a, a traditional Orthodox Jewish wedding, they don't tell the bride the day or the hour. Neither does the bridegroom. The only one who knows is the father of the bride. He decides. And you say, well, why? Uh, well, because the, the bridegroom has to build the house or the bridal chamber they're going to live in. And you say, well, why doesn't he just build it really fast and they can pick a date? And well, no, because if they left it up to the son, he would just pitch a little pup tent and get married tomorrow, right? <laughs> So they said, it's, it's left up to the father. And the father says, no, you're going to build a home where you're going to have, and usually it was on the farm where you're adding on to the family and where you're going to have our grandchildren and we're going to share all of the blessings God's given to us. And the father says, I am the one who will approve it. And you, you better spend your blood, sweat, and tears and everything you've got into that home because it's, these are, this is my progeny and I want to be able to bless it. 
It was the tradition of, of Jewish uh, fathers to wait until their son, who every day, the house is almost finished, Dad, today, and he goes, ah, you could do this a little better and, you know, <laughs> cherry this out a little. He's like, oh. And so one night when his son is exhausted, trying to please his father by preparing a place, the father wakes up his son in the middle of the night and says, okay, son, now you can go. And he starts hollering and yelling and shouting. He goes, gets the best man. They get the other best men, uh, the groomsmen, and they start running through the valley, yelling, shouting, and hollering at the top of their voices to the bride on the other side of the valley. Her only warning of getting ready and getting her wedding dress and makeup is to listen for the shouts. Now think of this. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. You know what he's shouting about? He's getting married. And the voice of the Lord and the archangel and the trumpet of God and we shall be caught up in a moment. And that's literally an abduction without going into the details of theology on the rapture. That's what the, the bridegroom does. He steals the bride from her father's house and he smiles knowingly. He's excited and the whole family comes together for a seven day feast. That's where we are at. So I have a word uh, from the Lord for all of you this year. And it's this word, write it down, breakthrough. This 2014 will be for you and for those who are open to it, a year of breakthrough. Um, in a year, you know, when we look at what's just happened in 2013, moving into 20, 000, uh, 2014, in a year in which the history channels, the Bible was the most watched miniseries on cable TV. And the Pope was Time Magazine's person of the year and Billy Graham's Killing Jesus is a New York Times bestseller. Bill O'Reilly. Okay, I was just seeing if you were paying attention. Bill O'Reilly's Killing Jesus is a New York Times bestseller. And the faith, if I may say, of Duck Dynasty's Phil Robertson is the talk of the country. 2014 is also a year in which Hollywood's, listen, major motion picture studios are preparing this year, 2014, to release biblical blockbusters about Jesus, Noah, Moses, and the little boy who went to heaven. Now, I'm not gonna show you the, the whole thing, I've shortened it up a little bit, but I, I want you to see, this is movies that are gonna be shown, not to Christians or in churches, but in movie houses that will be taken around the world. So. Uh, for the next few minutes, watch on the screens. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there's, does that look interesting? All these movies are coming out, and another one on Moses, so God is doing something. And um, yeah, the little boy, Colton, uh, the book is called Heaven is for Real. And the funny thing is, you know, after this experience, and they, they were worried about him because he had basically died, uh, which the book and the movie will show, but... Um, they're saying, so Colton, they were driving by the hospital where he was and they, were, they wanted to see if he was relating to reality. They go, do you remember uh, the hospital where you were when you were so sick? And he looked over and he goes, yeah. He goes, that's where the angel sang to me. And uh, they go, the angel sang to you? And so they were kind of, you know, at the first they didn't believe him, but they said, well, so what did the angel sing to you? And he goes, they sang, Jesus loves me, this I know. <laughs> they go, really? Anything else? And he goes, well, I asked him if they knew, we will, we will rock you. But they said, no, we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's going to be an amazing year. Now listen, I believe this can be a year of breakthrough. Um, God is both humble. There, there is no one more humble in the universe, more gentle or tender than God. On the other hand, there is no one more fierce, mighty, or powerful than God. God, 2,000 years ago, humbled himself, became a man, became a lamb, became sacrificed. The one who's coming back soon, 2,000 years later, is the lion, part of his nature. God, we're gonna be experiencing something that the generation of Moses saw, where God, through Moses, his servant, said, I am taking on every rival, idol, and God that people think is God. I'm gonna knock them all down. I don't know if you know this, but each one of the 10 plagues uh, that e Egypt went through were an idol that was worshiped uh, by the ancient Egyptians. They worshiped frogs, which is kind of strange. 
So, so God, I think it's funny, has a little sense of humor, right? You, you worship frogs because they're by the Nile and they worshiped it. He goes, so you like frogs? I'll give you lots more. And he just, there were frogs on the walls, frogs on the halls. They're throwing frogs out their window. And so God's making fun. You're throwing your God out the window. You know, this is not your God. God's going to be taking on the gods of this world. Now, I want to also share with you this. As I was reading through the story of the Exodus, note this, the Jewish people at that time went through the first three plagues. I don't know when the Lord's gonna come, and I don't think we're going through the great tribulation, but I, Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation, but be a good cheer, I've overcome the world. So um, we may go through and see things before the Lord comes that we had never bargained for, but I know this, there came a point after the third plague, God said, now, because he wanted to show the Egyptians, my people are human beings just like you, and they suffer, and they feel, and they have hurt, and they have pain. But now I'm going to show you my power. And he made a distinction, and he left them alone in the land of Goshen. And Goshen was not, from those, the last seven plagues, not affected. And I believe God is getting ready to bring you and I into that land of Goshen. And so it can be a major breakthrough year of letting go of fear, of anger, of bitterness, of jealousy, of repentance and returning to our first love. I bring a word of encouragement to you from our brothers and sisters in the Middle East. Um, recently, this last year, in 2013, over 210 churches were planted in Egypt. So while we only see the fightings and, and you know, all of the things going on, the church is involved in planting churches. In Syria, the most brutal war in 20 years that involved the use of chemical weapons uh, there was a, there's one of our main guys who works over there, uh, we'll call him Amir, not his real name. His parents, his mom and dad, who are also pastors, were recently kidnapped by terrorists for a high sum of tens of thousands of dollars, which they didn't have. And uh, so we prayed for them, we asked God's divine mercy, and miraculously they were delivered from the terrorists, and they were set free. And then we were all praying, they need to get out of the country. Well, instead of getting out of the country, this elderly uh, couple have decided to stay in Syria. They said, we are needed here now more than ever before. And in fact, recently, they, they looked both ways, and they went out into the public where they had just been kidnapped, and they passed out over 350 Bibles to Muslims in Syria. So they are praying uh, for you and I. Um, and, and in Jordan, 20 new churches were planted with the Syrian refugees uh, that were Sunni Muslims. There is a targeted attack by radical jihadists um, to kill Christians and to threaten them. And over time, persecution of Christians has been a failed initiative. And in fact, it seems uh, that wherever Christianity has been persecuted and where they live in danger, or even where there is martyrdom, Christianity flourishes. And God gives even more dreams and visions of his power and of his presence. They do not, listen to this, when we ask them about their prayers, they do not pray for the persecutions to go away. They pray for their persecutors to have their eyes open to Jesus. They pray for strength, they pray for courage, and they pray for boldness, and they pray for you and I. I believe that we are living in days where God is raising up a remnant, um, and where he is ready to take on, as I mentioned, the idols of this world. There is coming a Mount Carmel moment uh, I believe in the near future, where God's ready to take all of the various religions, philosophies, and gods and goddesses up to the mountain, and he's ready to bring fire from heaven so that all those who know him will return to him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And um, the days, as it were, of Elijah are here. If you want to write this down, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Answering the question, what is headed our way? Answer, perilous times. Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. What would you say is the number one idol in America? What is the number one God? Money. 
So if God wants to take down his rivals, what does that say about the prospects uh, for where people are putting their faith, their hope, and their trust? God is wanting to get our attention. So there are going to be, I believe, economic trials and tribulations to come and in the near future. Uh, there will be more moral chaos, natural disasters, earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, hurricanes, potentially war in the Middle East. But the last thing that I want to leave with you this morning is uh, this sign that I just will spend a few moments talking about, the signs in the heaven. There are four blood moons <laughs> coming. Now, you know there's a scripture in the prophet of Joel, and Joel said that the moon shall be turned into blood, and the sun shall be darkened for the great day of the Lord. That prophecy was made 2,500 years ago. It was quoted 500 years later in the book of Acts, chapter 2, by none other than Peter. The moon shall be turned into blood, and the sun shall turn black, and then the Spirit of the Lord will be poured out. Now, and then Jesus said in Luke 21, 25, there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Now, I grew up, you know, hearing about the coming of the Lord and get ready and the rapture and all those various things, but I don't know why nobody ever really defined what that meant, that the moon would be blood and the sun would be dark. I kind of got the idea that it was something supernatural, maybe from you know, war or nuclear war, uh, casting these, these shadows. I've come to learn from my, our Jewish believing brothers, our messianic brothers, they said, no, that's not, I mean, yes, it is, behind it is supernatural, but God uses natural events. If you wanna write down Genesis chapter one, verse 14. In the very beginning of the Bible, uh, God says that he set the lights in the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars, in the firmament for signs and seasons. The Hebrew word signs means literally signals. So the sun, moon, and stars are signals. The word seasons, I always thought that meant summer, spring, winter, fall, but it doesn't. The Hebrew word is moed, and what it really means is the feasts of the Lord. Leviticus chapter 23, there are seven feasts, right? And the Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Well, those seven feasts are all fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And very quickly, the first four are his first coming. And the last three are his second coming. The first four are in the spring, the last three are in the fall, but there's this huge gap in the middle of summer where there are no harvests. Well, here's what the, the Jewish believers of the New Testament discovered. Because Israel had already been celebrating those seven feasts for 1,500 years, going back to the days of Moses. But when the Messiah came, Jesus, he fulfilled the first four. He was crucified on the Feast of Passover. He was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He was resurrected on the day of the Feast of First Fruits, the first fruits of the resurrection that Paul talks about, and the Holy Spirit fell on the exact day of the Feast of Pentecost. So the first four all happened, and then there's a gap. Well, we've had a 2,000 year gap called the Church Age, where God is bringing a Jew and a Gentile, bringing them together and making one new man in the body of Christ. Guess what the next feast is to be fulfilled? The Feast of Pentecost trumpets. That's the one that we're waiting for next, the Feast of Trumpets. And I don't know if you knew this or not, it's the only of the seven feasts that is at a new moon, you know, where there's just a, the beginning sliver of a new month. And because of that, some Jews were in Jerusalem, some were, uh, you know, farther away. They couldn't tell exactly when was the first day. Was it yesterday or did we see the sliver today? So therefore, for a time immemorial, Israel has always celebrated this one particular feast over two days. It's known as the Feast of the One Long Day, or another Hebrew idiom is, it's the feast you do not know the day or the hour. <laughs> the Feast of Trumpets. And there are many now, uh, you know, as, as the church gets more familiar with our Jewish roots that are saying, hey, sounds like you know, for Thessalonians 4 and, and the rapture and the Lord coming and then atonement would be the second coming of Christ's tabernacles, the millennium. But here's what I wanna say to you, that um, 
the Jewish perspective, my Jewish brothers, they have told me, no, when it, when it says the moon will be turned blood, it's just, it's talking about a lunar eclipse. And when the sun is darkened, it's talking about a solar eclipse. And I go, well, that happens all the time. How do you know if it has, this, this happen and nothing significant happens. And my friend, my Jewish uh, friend, Mark Bilt said, ah, he said, but the, the lunar eclipse or the red moon, the signal, when it happens on a feast day, that's when it becomes, that's when God is trying to tell you something. Or when there is a, you know, a, a sun. He also said that a lunar eclipse or a red moon is a sign or omen about Jews, about Israel. Because they follow the moon and the sun is an omen or a sign to the Gentiles because we follow the sun. So God's gonna get the attention of the whole world. Well, I wanna tell you something. Um, on April 15th of this year, on Passover, there is a full red moon, exactly on the day of Passover, which happens to be tax day, so it'll help you remember. <laughs> How many want to be delivered from earthly taxes and invest in the kingdom of heaven? Okay, so the first feast um, of, of Passover is the first of the seven, and the last feast is Tabernacles, and this year, in the fall, on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, is a red moon. So the beginning of God's calendar and the end of God's calendar is like God put two red dots and said, pay attention. Next year, in 2015, it happens again, where on the first day of Passover, there's a red, full red moon, and on the first day of Tabernacles in 2015, a full red moon, two years in a row. What does it mean? Well, that's where you t get into trying to make predictions, and God doesn't ask us to make predictions. Um, I love what my pastor, Chuck Smith, my pastor Chuck Smith said. He said, prophecy is best understood after it's already happened. <laughs> so you say, well, why are you bringing this to our attention? And here's why. While we can't predict what will happen, we can look backwards and say, what did actually happen when there were four blood moons two years in a row on the feast days. And we can then say, well, there's a pattern. And with the pattern, at the very least, you can lay it like a transparency into the future and say, we ought to be watching, waiting, and wondering. Now, I want you to know this. For there to be four blood moons on Passover tabernacles two years in a row, on the, exactly on the feast days, signals, signs, in the seasons, so that God is intersecting with our world, the spiritual and the natural are intersecting, has open, only happened three times in the last 500 years. So let's lay aside 2014 and 15, which by the way is the only time it's gonna happen for the, for the rest of this century. Looking backwards, guess when the last time there were four blood moons on the feast days? 1967 and 1968. Does anybody know what happened? And blood moons are about Israel. Did anything happen with Israel in 1967? A six-day war. Israel was in war with five Arab nations at the same time, and the war was over in six days. And what happened was, in those six days, Israel captured the Golan Heights, the mountains to the north on the border of Syria. They captured the West Bank, the most controversial area on the planet. They conquered the Gaza Strip, which they recently gave back. But most importantly, they conquered East East Jerusalem, which is where the Temple Mount is. And the world's been fighting over it ever since. That's what they're all talking about is because of the Six Day War. Okay, Pr how many would agree that was pretty significant? <laughs> when was the last time there were four blood moons, two years in a row, on the, the, the feast days, the signals on the feast days, which means divine appointment? 1949 and 1950, which followed 1948, which on May 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel was reborn. It's never happened to any other people in the history of the human race that a people who lost their homeland were scattered to the four corners of the earth for two millennium, then came back to their original place and started their country again. Israel was born in 1948. That was the, that was the time before there were four blood moons. You have to go back all the way back to and I know you'll remember this one. The last time before that, the third, the only the third time in the last 500 years was 1493 and 1494. 
He said, well, what's that? Don't you remember? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Well, there's a, uh, something very significant happened. Uh, the, the Jews were expelled from Spain and they were kicked out. That began a 500 year migration of the Jews through Europe. Some of them landed in Europe. Some of them actually landed in America, especially in New York. And eventually they made their way uh, to the Holy Land. It was kind of the beginning of them being, you know, starting to head back to the Holy Land. So um, I believe that we are entering into, here, here's, here's what I think is, is about uh, to happen. This is now just looking at the patterns and saying, Lord, what are you saying? Um, I believe that we're in one of the most prophetic hours of human history right now. There's more going on than we can even imagine. And I believe the next four years, the world is gonna change, not only in the Middle East, but in America and around the world, uh, geopolitically, economically, morally, uh, in ways, we, four years from now, if we're still here, you can't even, we cannot imagine what it will be like. And I, I look at it as, for those who are believers, we're coming under the blood, just like in the days of Passover. Every house that had the blood, you're gonna be protected, come what may. So I, I recommend that you be in the blood and that your house be under the blood and that your personal life and your marriage and your kids be under the blood. Can I have an amen on that? Amen. And uh, that you be waiting and watching and getting as close to Jesus as you possibly can. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. The last thing that I... Uh, would point out that we don't have time to go into, but every time there have been these four blood moons and God dealing with Israel, there has been a, a powerful, fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In fact, many of you here are products of the Jesus people. And I don't know if you realize it, but the Jesus people and that whole movement of God that wasn't started by the church, it was caught by some, like Pastor Chuck Smith, like a wave, but it happened after the four blood moons and the six day war. God, when he deals with, his is with Israel, he deals with his bride by pouring out his spirit. And um, you know, there may be somebody here that is saying, you know what, I, I don't know where I stand with God and if, if you are wrestling with loneliness or emptiness uh, or guilt or fear of death, the best thing you could do is ask Jesus into your heart. He's always been with you, he's always loved you, he'll never leave you nor forsake you, and you say, well, I believe in him. And in fact, I'm sitting here and I'm listening and I congratulate you. That's the first step in being a follower is sitting and listening. But there comes a moment where he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in. I'll forgive you. I'll save you. I'll fill you with my spirit. I've prepared a place in heaven. It's a gift that is so humbling. You'll spend the rest of eternity trying to show the Lord how thankful you are. And it's like breath. Uh, God will breathe into you new life. So I'm gonna lead all of us, everybody that knows the Lord, let's pray this prayer. For some, it may be kind of a recommitment of coming to the Lord, but there may be one man, one woman, one boy, one girl that for the very first time, you're asking the spirit of Jesus Christ to come into your life. So would you just say this simple prayer out loud with me? Because the Bible says if you say with your mouth, confess Jesus the Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So. Would you pray out loud with me if you're, if you're willing? And let's pray out loud after this manner. Dear Lord, I admit that I am a sinner and I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I am so sorry for everything I've done wrong. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross in my place. I open the door of my heart and I ask you to come into my life to be my personal Lord and Savior. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. I receive the gift of eternal life. Now help me follow you, Jesus, all the way to heaven until I see you face to face. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen.